Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. This week, we're going to talk about caulk guns, and we'd like to thank Maria Autoby for liking and sharing the podcast. And this week, we have an interview with Benjamin Franklin Plumbing, and we got some plumbing tips. Cool. One of the first patents for a caulk gun was in Canada in 1894, and they called the tool a putty tool. In 1936, the Albion Company got a patent for one of the first smooth rod caulk guns. In the 1940s, the Dix Pontius Company started marketing caulk in disposable cartridges for homeowners. The Dick Pontius Company later became the Dix Armstrong Pontius Company, and they shortened that to DAP, DAP. DAP developed some of the first latex caulks in the 1960s, acrylic caulk in the 1970s, and siliconized latex caulk in the 80s. A manual caulk gun can be used for a lot of projects around the house. Like what? (laughs) You can use it for caulking around doors, windows, and siding outside to stop moisture, bugs, and air movement. You can use it for asphalt driveway crack filler or concrete crack filler. You can get chimney caulk for flashing or for filling cracks on the chimney cap. There's roofing caulk for holes or gaps in roofing, and there are caulk products for filling cracks in a foundation wall. Right. You would use caulk or silicone to seal the corners inside a tub or shower. You can use painter's caulk to fill small cracks on walls and ceilings before you prime and paint or to fill gaps around trim. A caulk gun can also be used for construction adhesives, glazing for windows, and duct sealants. And because it can be used with such a wide range of products, there's going to be a big difference in the thickness or viscosity of the material the gun is pushing out of a caulk tube. Right. One of the key features to compare with a quality caulk gun is the thrust ratio. I spoke to Newborn Caulk Guns, and Newborn is N-E-W-B-O-R-N. They said a thrust ratio is a ratio of the force you apply on the trigger versus the force on the rod pushing the material out of the caulk tube. A 6 to 1 ratio, for example, means for every 1 pound of force on the handle, Six pounds of force is transferred to the rod, pushing out the material. Hmm. For thin materials like latex, acrylics, and many silicones, a caulk gun with a low thrust ratio of 10 to 1 or under will work well. For thicker material like construction adhesive or urethanes, you'd want a higher thrust ratio from 18 to 1 to 26 to 1. All right. I spoke to Ox Tools, it's O-X, capital T-O-O-L-S. They recommend looking at caulk guns with dual thrust. This type of caulk gun can switch between two different thrust ratios, so you can get the best control and easy application depending on whether you're using low or high viscosity products. That's cool. They said a dual thrust caulk gun is also good for adapting to the temperature. You can use a higher ratio when it's cold outside, Hmm. and then you can switch to a low ratio when you're inside using thinner caulks. Interesting. A higher thrust ratio is also going to make it easier to squeeze the handle if you cut a small opening on the tip of a caulk tube, which will help you control the caulk. Mm -hmm. There are two types of rods to push the caulk out of the caulk tube, smooth and notched. With a notched or ratcheting caulk gun, The rod advances as you pull the trigger and the notches hold the rod in place. But to release the pressure on the tube and to stop the flow of the caulk, you have to twist the rod so the notches are pointing up and then pull it back. Ah. With most ratcheting, inexpensive caulk guns, they're going to have a low thrust ratio around 5 to 1. All right. A smooth rod is going to give you more control of how the rod advances, and with most smooth rod caulk guns, they're going to have a thumb release to release the pressure on the caulk tube, which is easier to use. Mm -hmm. Another feature to look for is dripless. The caulk gun automatically releases pressure on the rod, 
That way the caulk doesn't keep flowing out of the tube or it helps reduce excess caulk from coming out of the tube when you release the trigger. Because it could be messy. <laughs> yeah, it can be. Yeah, you, you've got to really have kind of a lot of experience with a caulk gun that doesn't relieve the pressure because you've got to keep moving as you squeeze that handle all the way together and then release it. It's still pushing out caulk and then you start to squeeze again. So if you should practice before you start. Yeah, it's good to practice on a, like, like a, a scrap piece of wood. Or cardboard. Or, or cardboard. So if you're creating long beads with a dripless caulk gun, as you squeeze that handle all the way together, you can just stop the caulk gun right there, let the handle open up, and then continue as you squeeze the caulk gun again, or squeeze the handle again. So it's a lot easier for beginners to use. For anybody to use. For anyone to use. Well, if you're using a caulk gun, like when we did my parents' driveway, Right. And I was using a caulk gun with a crack filler. I mean, my <laughs> right. hand at the end of it was, I, yeah. I was exhausted. Yeah. Well, it's funny that day we had, well, I had one of my old caulk guns in, 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 in the car where I've used it for a lot of projects like roofing and, and things. So it was beat up and I didn't mind using it for crack filler for your asphalt driveway. Okay, but it still sucked. But it had a low thrust ratio where a higher thrust ratio would be a lot easier to use for a big project like that. Thanks. <laughs> A caulk gun with a revolving frame lets you rotate the frame as you caulk around corners or change directions with your caulk gun. Mm -hmm. And if you have an angled cut on your tip, it's going to help you maintain a smooth bead as you rotate the frame with one hand and control the flow of the caulk with your other hand. Mm. Caulk guns with a built-in spout cutter are handy if you're on a ladder or if you don't have a knife in your pocket. You should always have a knife in your pocket. <laughs> yes, always have a pocket knife. The spout cutter is a hole in the handle, and you push the tip of your caulk tube in that and squeeze the handle, mm -hmm. and it'll cut a hole in the tip. And I found with the more expensive caulk guns, they do a very nice job of cutting the tip, but with some of the low-cost guns, it'll tear or crush the caulk tube tip. That's not good. And, the, and in that case, a utility knife is going to create a more accurate and smooth opening. Mm-hmm. A caulk gun with a ladder hook is handy for hanging the gun on ladder rails, a pocket, or a tool belt, and the hook is on the end of the rod. Mm -hmm. A caulk gun with an integrated seal puncture tool or piercing rod is a thin rod that can be used to puncture the seal inside many tubes of caulk, and the seal is there to help keep the material fresh. And this is convenient if you have a small hole in the tip of a caulk tube because if you try to use a long nail, you can spread the tip open too wide. Right. If you're shopping for a caulk gun in a hardware store or a home center, pull back the rod and squeeze the trigger to see how it fits in your hand. If it has a thumb release, you'd push in the thumb release as you pull back the rod. If it's a ratcheting style, you would spin the rod so the notches are facing up. You'd pull back the rod and then spin it so the notches are facing down. But you want to see how the handle feels as you squeeze it, if it pinches your fingers or if it feels too big or too small in your hand. Because if you're doing a lot of projects, you want it to feel comfortable and you want to be able to have good control over the pressure you're applying to the caulk tube. Mm -hmm. Newborn caulk guns say they have a caulk gun with a padded grip, so it's easier on your hand. Cool. Compare the weight of the caulk gun Caulk guns with an open frame style or a frame made from composite materials are going to be lighter and easier to use on large projects. Mm -hmm. Oxtool says a caulk gun with an enclosed thrust mechanism is going to keep caulk out of the moving parts. Newborn recommends using a caulk finishing tool to help push the material into the joint and give you a professional look. Right. Some top-rated caulk finishing tools come from Newborn, Kramer, C-R-A-M-E-R, Hyde Tools, H-Y-D-E, and DAP, D-A-P. Some top-rated caulk guns come from Newborn, Ox Tools, Solid Work, it's S-O-L-I-D, capital W-O-R-K, Red Devil, R-E-D, capital D-E-V-I-L, Dripless, D-R-I-P-L-E-S-S, -S, and Albion, A-L-B-I-O-N. I spoke to David from Benjamin Franklin Plumbing, and I got some plumbing tips. David, how you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking. How are you? Real good. Thank you. 
I was hoping you could help us with some tips for homeowners to prevent some plumbing problems around the holidays. Yes, sir. I can. I think I can help you with that. Let's start with uh, garbage disposals. That seems to be one of the most common calls that we uh, get this time of year. Uh, so if we could, I'd like to give you some tips uh, on how to prevent some of those. And I want to start by telling you there's a proper way to use your disposal. A lot of people uh, run into problems. They put too much food in the disposal and they turn the water on and then they turn the power. Uh, if you'll turn the, the water on first, cool water, let cool water start running through there, then turn the power on and then putting the proper things down in the disposal. There, there's just certain things that you shouldn't be putting down there. Don't put bones and like pork, chicken, beef bones, you know, those aren't designed to go down through there. Potato pills, uh, banana pills, starchy foods like that can create a paste uh, that will clog the drains and, and cause you some problems. Fats and greases should never be put down in your sinks and disposals. Uh, it's going to create uh, clogs and uh, unwanted odors um, that will accumulate in your garbage disposals. You know, pastas and rice are another thing that when you put down there, they will form a paste and that will stop that disposal up. These are just things that uh, you shouldn't be putting down in your disposals. When we have so much family over at this time of year. Uh, you have so many different people putting stuff in there and you're trying to get it all done. These are the things that, uh, that create these issues that if you'll avoid those, that will keep you from having to call a plumber out this time of year. Now, some other things that you can do as you prepare for to have an influx of family over this time of year, uh, there are ways to clean your garbage disposal. One of the things that we recommend that you do is just take a small handful of ice cubes, put those down your, uh, your drain, run the disposal for a while with some water running behind it, and don't overstuff the disposal. But when you'll do these, inside your disposal, uh, you have hammers that slide back and forth. And so by doing, you know, putting the handful of ice cubes down through there and running the water, that keeps those hammers free and from sticking and it allows them to work and, and function properly so that the things that you properly put down the disposal uh, that belong down there, it will shred those things up and allow them to go down through the drain system and avoid unnecessary uh, clogs and jamming up of the disposal. You know, if you've had a disposal in your house and had it replaced in several years, we'll get smells from them. We recommend that you cut a few wedges of citrus fruit and add those to your drain. Let it chop those things up as water's running behind it, and that'll eliminate some of those smells. And always use cool water when you're, when you're running those through the disposal, never warm. And if you do these tips and avoid putting certain things down through there, putting the proper things down your disposal that it was designed for will help you eliminate those clogs and untimely jams. If you've got luck like I've had in the past, never happens at a good time. And, <laughs> and with the holidays coming up, you know, you got a house full of people and and preparing the foods and everything that's going on, the last thing that you want to have is an untimely stoppage or a jam disposal. And these right. are some of the things that you can do to avoid those. And what happens if you do have a clogged garbage disposal? So a couple things that you can do on those. Underneath the bottom of the disposal, there's a spot for an Allen wrench. Your disposal comes with those, but most homeowners have no clue where it's at. It's been thrown in a junk drawer, and you right. wouldn't know how to find it when you needed it. But if underneath the bottom, there's a spot for an Allen wrench that allows you to move the motor on the inside that's jammed up. And so if you have something that's wedged, that hammer's got something wedged up against the sidewall of the disposal, that should allow that thing to break it free. Okay. And you're just turning that both directions? Yes, sir. You just want to take it and take it counterclockwise and clockwise until that frees up. And then once that frees up, you want to have water running in there and just hit the power switch. If you have something that has jammed up in there and before you can get the power turned off, it trips the breaker, there is on the bottom side of, your, of all disposals that I'm aware of, there is a red reset button. So the first thing you want to do is you're going to want to reset that button and then take that on wrench, work that inside motor side to side till you break whatever the obstruction is. You want to break that free. And once that you know that you've got that freely turning, then once you've had the water running, whatever you broke free still needs to be shredded. Turn the power on behind that. Another thing that you can put on there to prevent clogs, it's a screen that you can buy at your local hardware store, and it goes right over the opening of that disposal. So when you're washing your dishes or cleaning stuff off, preparing foods, anything like that, 
that metal screen that you put over there will catch all of those things. It's a good thing that you can put on there. They're very inexpensive. You can get them any, at any hardware store. And we're starting to see these with our customers. Uh, customers are asking about those. Is it something that we recommend? And we recommend anything that will keep you from having a situation that's unnecessary where something's falling down through there that doesn't belong. So one of the things that we're constantly um, educating our customers on and having our technicians talk to customers are flushable wipes. Uh, you need to be very careful about the things that you put down uh, your toilets that go into your sanitary system. If you're putting anything down there that's not toilet paper itself, they're really not designed to go into the system. And I know we all see them and we see the commercials. Our recommendation is if it's not toilet paper, uh, avoid putting that down your toilet. And there's a couple of reasons why, uh, just for you as an home, a homeowner and not to get into a situation this time of year where you've got a lot of people coming to the house, family, and, and you're entertaining, is if a toilet has siphon jets that go around the bowl of the toilet and the odor a toilet gets, uh, if you've ever flushed a toilet and it's got just a slow, lazy swirl, you know, it's got to pick up momentum to go down there. You know, that's a toilet that may have some calcium buildup on that inside rim of that bow. And so those siphon jets may not be functioning the way they're supposed to, to get that water movement, to get everything to go down, right? And so when you're putting excessive amounts of toilet paper down there, because you, you live in a newer house, and so you think you can use the same amount of toilet papers in your house, be careful of putting anything down there other than toilet paper for one. And two, the amount of toilet paper that goes down through there can cause those kind of clogs. And that's where it would come from is the siphon jets on there aren't able to circulate and get that swirl uh, siphon that needs to to get everything to go through that P-trap, over that P-trap, and into the sanitary system. And so you as a homeowner would know before you have people come over to your house, you know there's a certain amount of paper uh, or back-to-back -back flushes that it typically stops up. Those are things that you might want to inform your family members or guests as you're coming in to, to use your facilities in your home that, hey, nothing goes down uh, the toilet, toilet paper, the, you know, the flushable wipes, we put those uh, in a container next to the toilet. Uh, that will avoid you some issues at the most inc inconvenient time uh, this time of year when you've got extra people at the house. And I would think, too, with the new high-efficiency toilets, there's less water trying to move waste and toilet paper also. That's correct. And so when you have less water, uh, to try to accomplish the same thing, you're already uh, creating a, a situation. And one of the things that we talk to our technicians about when we go in and do a safety inspection on someone's home uh, is to be aware, if you see someone has a plunger next to their toilet, you just bring that up in conversation as, you know, is this a reoccurring event that you have with this particular toilet or is it, why, why would you have a plunger beside there? And usually what we get, it's in an, a home that's got an older toilet and uh, they've switched either to a you know new low flush toilet and they haven't changed the amount of toilet papers are going down there or they're flushing supposedly flushable wipes down through there so they have a reoccurring issue so we talk to customers about things like that i do Sorry. want to mention while we're on that subject if you have you know the shutoff valve that's beside the toilet we should all be aware and you should check those things because when you have an unfortunate event you've got a stoppage and the toilet's overflowing that is how you shut the water off to your toilet. Uh, most homeowners never think about take, going to that valve and shutting it off until they need it. So I would recommend, that, you know, periodically, we do it on our home inspections when we go out and go over and uh, educate our customers about the things that they should be checking, is you don't want to have one of those that's seized up because it hasn't been turned off since the toilet was put in. Now, the last thing you want to find out is when you need something is it doesn't work. And so you should just simply be able to go in there and be able to turn that thing. It's, you know, righty tighty lefty loosey And you'll know pretty quick if that thing is seized up or not. And you would definitely want to get that thing taken care of before you start entertaining for the holidays. One thing I can recommend uh, on toilets, we've all seen the cleaners that you can put inside the tank. We do not recommend those. The little blue globs that you put in there, the other chemicals that you can put in the tank, uh, those are very hard and corrosive on the working components of the toilet, especially the flappers, uh, the different working parts that are inside the fill valves. Those will prematurely cause those things to fail. 
especially those uh, the bleach tabs. We're we're seeing quite a bit now. People are just putting the bleach tabs inside the tank, and I understand why they're doing those. When you flush it, that goes through the siphon jets and uh, swirls around the inside of the bowl of the toilet. It's our recommendation to do any type of cleaning on the, on the toilets should be done on, inside the bowl. You want to use some type of mild cleaner. Avoid harsh chemicals. They can be harmful to your health and to our environment. So we uh, don't recommend using those. That that's one thing that we do. The other thing I would recommend if you've got you've got a toilet that's in a hallway somewhere where you can't hear it ticking on and kicking off very often. Most of your hardware stores have dye tabs. Uh, they're usually free. If you don't want to have those, most most homes um, have some type of dye for when we dye our eggs at Easter and all that kind of stuff. Like a food coloring. Yes, sir. If you'll take that food coloring, put a few drops of that inside the tank and give it about five minutes. And what you'll see is the inside of the tank that's you know holding the amount of water that's in that tank. If that thing is sealing off, there should be no streaks of that dye getting down into the bowl. No matter how fast or how slow they get down in there, that is determining that you've got water that's getting by the flapper and easing down into the bowl. And so what's happening, if, if it's in your bedroom where you can hear it, you're going to hear that thing kicking on and off. Well, every time that does, that's money that's just went down the drain, costing you money on your water bill. It's wasteful. And if you are getting that dye is getting down into your bowls, you need to call and have that toilet serviced uh, so that you can avoid losing water and, and wasting water and you'll save money on your water bill. So let's talk about unclogging sinks. Okay. Um, we never recommend using harsh chemicals to put down your drains. One of the questions that we ask our customers, have you put any chemicals uh, down the drain? And the reason that is when we're working on that, we don't want to have that splash back and get on any of us. It's not good for your skin. Uh, so we recommend that you don't put any harsh chemicals down your drains. Uh, they corrode your pipes and most times they're a bigger hassle than they are to mess with. There are some things that you can do. You can use vinegar or baking soda. We've actually recommended that before. You want to mix equal parts vinegar and baking soda, pour it down the drain. It's going to foam and fizzle and eventually will clear and dislodge uh, the drains. Uh, a lot of times those happen over a period of time. It's just sludge buildup, especially if you think about it in your lavatories. Let's just go to your bathrooms for a second. That's going to be your shaving creams, toothpaste, uh, the different makeups that you're washing off and putting down the sinks. And so that's a natural way to do it. And how you'd want to do that is you want to put the plunger down, fill that sink up with hot water. And then as you're putting the, the vinegar and the baking powder solution in there, if it's not clogged all the way up, it's, even if it's a slow drain, you can't put this down in anything that's standing water. And that will allow that to free up. And you may have to do this two or three different times. And once you start seeing that thing uh, drain down just to, you know more normal, but maybe it's got still just a little bit of a slow drain behind it, you want to fill that thing up to the overflow in your lavatory sinks. There's usually a hole just on the counter side of that that you'd walk up to and let that thing drain down as many times as you can. Because once you've freed up that gum and buildup in there, as you're doing this, you're pushing all that stuff down that smaller piece of tubular that you've got and you're getting it into the sanitary system. And that'll avoid that. That'll eliminate that. The other thing that I want to let everybody know uh, that you can share is there are different sized plungers and your lavatory sinks uh, because of the way that bowl is shaped um, there is a smaller plunger that you that we recommend and the guys carry on their trucks that you can use for those lavatory drains your shower drains something you can stand right over and they're noticeably smaller uh, than what we would use on your toilets and so make sure you're using the proper equipment uh, for the job at hand and so you can pick any of those up at your local hardware stores and there's so many different ones out there. So for a, a bathroom sink, you'd be primarily using like a cup plunger rather yeah. than something with a flange on it for a toilet? Yes, sir. Um, thank you for pointing that out. But yes, you'd want to use a cup for your lavatories and, and it's completely different when you see them, uh, just like you described it, uh, one's going to work so much better, the cup style on your lavatories versus the plunger flange style uh, for your toilets. Let's talk about low pressure in your home. So when we're addressing low pressure, we get that kind of call. Uh, some of the things we want to know is that at a single fixture, is it a shower head that you know that uh, you've noticed all of a sudden you're not getting the same kind of pressure out of it? 
is a laboratory faucet is it isolated to a single fixture. So let's look at it from that perspective. You notice that when you go to use your shower or the lavatory faucet, it just doesn't have the same amount of pressure coming out of it. So inside those, uh, on a shower faucet, or the shower head, I should say, you have a screen that's in there. So what I would recommend that you do is you can unscrew that shower head and look inside there and see if there's any debris that's come through the water system and has got that screen clogged up. And then you can simply remove and flush that screen out and then put the shower head back on and see if that fixes the problem. The other thing that we run into uh, is calcium buildup on your shower heads. And there are ways uh, to clean that. You can take uh, small toothpicks, you can uh, clean those things out with pipe cleaners, you can soak them in uh, vinegar solution, CLRs, one that uh, you can use, and you simply would take and soak that shower head in that, and it would loosen up and free up all that calcium buildup if those are the issues. On your lavatory faucets uh, and your kitchen faucet, um, it has an aerator on it, and that simply removes, and it is just a giant screen, is all that is. And do the same thing. If it's, if it's an aerator and it's got uh, debris built up in it, you can clean that screen out. You can go to your local hardware store and just change out that aerator. And if those eliminate uh, the low pressure issues you're having, then we know that that was just simply related to just that. But let's go in another direction and say that you do those things or when you unscrew your shower head and you turn the fixture on and you still have low pressure, then that could be that you have something leaking in the pressure system and the line particularly that feeds that fixture group. Now, how you want to check for those, first thing that you can do with nothing running in the house, no fixtures on, you know that you don't have any running or dripping faucets or toilets, go out to your water meter. And on your water meter, you have a, you have a dial. And it's going to be a silver disc. It's going to be a red or blue triangle, different cities, different meters, different things. But those are leak indicators, and that's their purpose. The purpose of a leak indicator is to tell you with nothing on, nothing running, that should be perfectly still. If that's moving, that's indicating that you have water flowing through the meter with nothing on and that you need to get a professional out there to determine where that leak is. And, and a lot of times that can be attributed to the low pressure issues that you're having at that fixture. Now, for you as a homeowner, the things that you can do you can go down to your local hardware store and you can buy a pressure gauge. They're very, very inexpensive. And you can hook that up to an outside uh, hydrant. And so what you want to do in principle, it's the same thing as blowing a balloon up and tying a knot in it. And if there's no leaks in the system, then that thing should stay inflated. So take and unhook your garden hose, hook this thing up. And when you turn it on, that gauge is going to go up to whatever your incoming water pressure is. So let's just, for sake of uh, discussion, you got 60 pounds of pressure coming in, then you're going to want to shut the water off to the home. And if you have nothing leaking in the system, then that should maintain that pressure. If that thing starts to drop and go down, uh, that's indicating that you have a leak in your pressure system and, and you're going to need to call and get a professional out there to take it from there to find out what's leaking and to give you the appropriate course of action to fix it. David, if we wanted to learn more about Benjamin Franklin Plumbing, where would we go? I would recommend that you go to www.benjaminfranklinplumbing.com. And that would give you uh, our national number. And on that national number, you could just call that and it will route you um, by your area code uh, to the Ben Franklin in your area. All right. Very good. Well, I appreciate your time, David. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. That was a great interview. And you can check out Benjamin Franklin Plumbing at BenjaminFranklinPlumbing.com for a local plumber. Do you have anything else, Dan? We'd like to thank Ox Tools at OxToolsUSA.com. That's O-X-T-O-O-L-S-U-S-A.com. And Newborn at NewbornCaulkGuns.com. It's N-E-W-B-O-R-N-C-A-U-L-K-G-U-N-S dot com for helping us with this episode. And you should look at your caulk guns. I mean, you might have some cool features that you didn't know about, like the ladder hook I mean, <laughs> right. to cut the tip off, piercing tool. Right. Who knew? Let's wrap this up. 
You can subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our eBooks, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, Books 1 through 15 on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow Cindy on Twitter at fixitcohost. And you can follow us on Instagram, Fix It Home Improvement. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week. Deep, 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 deep,